What do you make of that ending? At first, it seems oddly anticlimactic, but the more I thought about it, the more disturbing it became. Now, there's nothing to suggest Howard will be taken into custody or that he'll find the perfect job for him, janitor at the Bedford Falls Sanitarium. Instead, we can only assume that the same scary scenario will play out in the next town Howard wanders into. Now, this quiet ending may seem like a small thing, but it's indicative of the kind of unexpected, ambiguous approach to storytelling that Ida Lupino tried to bring to her movies. Subversiveness can sneak up on you. doesn't need to be bombastic. Now, if this film were made today, Helen, probably played by Jamie Lee Curtis, would, of course, stab Howard to death in an orgiastic bloodbath finale, only to have his body be gone when the cops show up. Although this is basically a two-hander for Robert Ryan and Lupino, a couple of members of the supporting cast rate a mention. Helen's boarder, Mr. Armstrong, is played by versatile character actor Taylor Holmes, familiar to noir fans for memorable roles in Kiss of Death, Nightmare Alley, and Act of Violence. He and Lupino went way back. In fact, Holmes reminded Lupino that this production was a reunion of sorts for them. He'd performed with her father, Stanley Lupino, on the London stage in 1920. And it was his job to keep Ida from crying because she was only two years old at the time. The role of Ruth Williams, Helen's niece, was played by 19-year-old Barbara Whiting. I know one thing. Aunt Helen won't be quite so lonely anymore with you around. Her father, composer Richard Whiting, wrote such classics as Ain't We Got Fun on the good ship Lollipop, and hooray for Hollywood. Her sister, Margaret Whiting, was a popular singer in the 40s and 50s, and the two of them co-starred on the TV sitcom Those Whiting Girls, a summer replacement for I Love Lucy from 1955 to 57. Margaret later married Jack Wrangler, the biggest name in the annals of gay porn. But that's another story for another time. Harry Horner acquitted himself well in his first shot at directing. But then to hear him tell it, he'd been preparing for this all along. In a 1951 interview given before Lupino hired him to direct this film, Horner described his work as a film designer as being essentially a co-director. I go through the same processes as the main director, only I do it on paper. And then I have to explain it to the director, who in turn relays ideas to the actors. If I'm the director myself, it just eliminates an extra party in the transaction and makes it all so much simpler. Now, it probably helped to have a lead actress who was a pretty good director herself. As I mentioned before the film, Horner was a protege of theater legend Max Reinhardt. Despite the all-American name Harry Horner, he was born in Czechoslovakia when it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He joined Reinhardt's theater company in Vienna in the early 30s, and when the director emigrated to America in 1934, Horner came with him. He was one of Reinhardt's most trusted protégés and one of the most versatile. His career as a designer began almost accidentally when Reinhardt, unhappy with the work of art director Norman Belgetti's, assigned Horner to create all new sets for a Broadway production of Kurt Weill's musical The Eternal Road. Not only that, Horner doubled as the conductor of the orchestra, Musical talent ran in the family's blood. Harry Horner's son, James Horner, was one of the most prolific film composers of recent times, with scores that included Braveheart, Apollo 13, A Beautiful Mind, and Titanic. Now, among Harry Horner's early credits as production designer were The Little Foxes, A Double Life, and Born Yesterday. So he obviously learned a lot about directing from two of the best in the business. His own directing career was confined to the 1950s and featured a couple of other noirs. 1953's Vicky, a low-contrast remake of the 1941 Fox film I Wake Up Screaming, and the intriguing and hard-to-find A Life in the Balance, a U.S.-Mexico co-production from 1955 that starred Ricardo Montalban, Anne Bancroft, and Lee Marvin. It's based on a novella by Georges Simenon, and Horner co-directed it with Rafael Portillo. Although Horner never directed a feature after 1956, he was far from finished creatively. He returned to production design and won a second Oscar for 1961's The Hustler. After that, he worked on an eclectic array of pictures, including 
They shoot horses, don't they? Up the sandbox, Harry and Walter go to New York, and Walter Hill's existential neo-noir, The Driver. Horner had this to say about current trends in movies. There's a big movement toward the spectacle. It's a bad move and should be counteracted. The movies are going all out and trying to fill big screens with mass movement. Eventually, they'll get back to people and simple emotion again. He said that in 1954. Harry Horner died in 1994, but I wonder what he'd make of the mass movement on movie screens today. Always check in with us on the Noir Alley Facebook page and Twitter feed, and please, during this festive week, refrain from killing any spouses, loved ones, or family members during holiday celebrations. Speaking of which, next week we'll ring in the new year by visiting Ground Zero in the film noir movement. Be here when I present the most influential noir of them all, Double Indemnity. Feliz Navidad.